Good name. Amen. Amen. Now here's a, a question, especially for the younger ones. Now, I don't want you to feel as if you're going to go to school a day early or a few hours early. But how do you spell security? I'm not going to ask you to shout it out the answer. But how do you spell security? Well, I, I'm going to try and spell it. And you can see if I'm right or wrong. So security is spelled C-O-V-E-N-A-N-T. That spells security. Now, I'm not a good speller and I never have been. And I used to fear and tremble because when I was in primary three, I can still remember it. Lovely teacher, Mrs. Miller, one of the nicest teachers I ever had. But we used to do this thing where she would read, and our job was to write down whatever she read. And I used to almost physically shake and get sick because I knew I couldn't spell half the words. And uh, great fear came upon me. Now, I haven't made a mistake tonight. I haven't tried to spell security and blunder. The word that I just spelled out, of course, all the children know, but for the, for the adults and the grown-ups tonight that can't follow the spelling, uh, it's covenant. And that's how you spell security. And in many ways, that's exactly what this chapter in 1 Samuel 20 shows to us. That for David, at this stage in his life, and of course this would be true repeatedly through his life in a, in a greater sense, uh, was afforded security and everything that comes out of security, because with security we have peace and we have confidence and we are at rest. And therefore other things can develop, joy, and we can make progress in other areas of our lives so long as we've got security. Uh, and for David, security is rooted and grounded in the idea of covenant. And David has tried, as we know, and to some extent failed to find refuge and support and security elsewhere. And so he has to turn back to Jonathan. And he turns back to Jonathan, and it has something perhaps to do with friendship and kinship. It has something to do with, uh, if you like, sentimentality. Uh, he gets along well with Jonathan. They are close. They are deep friends. Uh, Jonathan has been helpful in the past, and he remembers all of that. But there is something much deeper than just friendship or just past experience that draws David back to Jonathan. He comes back to Jonathan because he knows that there is an obligation binding upon Jonathan to help him. Jonathan must help him. He simply has to, not because David's at wit's end corner, but because Jonathan and David have agreed a covenant. And David testifies to that in the eighth verse that we read a few moments ago. David is speaking and he says, Therefore thou shalt deal kindly with thy servant, for thou hast brought thy servant into a covenant of the Lord with thee. And if you want to know when that happened and what happened, turn back to chapter 18. And you read in chapter 18 in verse 3, Then Jonathan and David made a covenant, because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him, and gave it to David and his garments, even to the sword and to his bow and to his girdle. They made a covenant together. And as Jonathan takes his royal attire, that of a prince, as an heir to the throne, he takes that and he bestows it upon David. He is showing in this expression, in this uh, worked out manner, that there is a blessing that will come to David in terms of this covenant.
because that's part of a covenant, isn't it? That there's a benefit. If you're going to have a covenantal arrangement, there are three basic parts to a covenant. One is the people involved, what we might call the contracting parties. So you have two sides to a covenant. They, they make an agreement together. Here it's David and Jonathan. They come together in a covenant. There are terms and conditions. There's something that they both have to do. They have to agree to fulfill certain responsibilities. So each side of the covenant have to do something. And they have to agree to do them. And, and they're bound then to do whatever it, it is that the covenant states. And then thirdly, there are benefits or rewards. So if you hold up your end of the bargain, you do what you're contracted to do, then you get something as a result. A very simple ex uh, example of a contract or a covenant then is uh, working in employment. Uh, there are two parties, there's the employer and the employee. Uh, there are terms and conditions, if you like. Uh, so the employee says, I'll do so many hours of work uh, with whatever conditions the employer uh, says that they will uh, uphold, they'll, that they'll be given certain conditions and certain provisions and, and there will be certain payment at the end of that period of employment. And then there's the benefits. And the benefit then for the employee is he gets his wage, he gets his money at the end of the week. And for the employer, he has something produced or some activity done that will help him to make money. So it's a covenant, it's a gr an agreement. And this takes place between David and Jonathan. And this is what compels David to go back to Jonathan. That when he can't find help anywhere else, and he, he has a sense of hopelessness, that he can dare to hope. He can dare to hope that if he goes back to Jonathan, it is not doom and gloom, it is not despair, it's not all over. There is hope yet for him. And so we see in this 20th chapter, and especially for our purposes tonight, this first little section, that there, there is hope in hopeless times. There is hope in hopeless times. And that's because of the reality of a covenant agreement. And for us tonight, it's obviously got nothing to do with Jonathan and David. They're dead and gone. But for us, it's the covenant that is established between us and the Lord Jesus Christ, or more strictly speaking, it's the covenant that was made between God the Father and God the Son. And you say, well, where do, where do I fit in, in that? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ made that covenant, not for himself, but he made that covenant with his Father on the behalf of people like you and me where he agreed to do certain things on our behalf so that he would get certain benefits and rewards that he would then give to us. And so our hope in hopeless times is in that covenant that the Lord Jesus Christ, for our sakes, uh, made this covenant with his Father to enrich and to benefit us. Well, the first thing to notice and to remind ourselves of again here is just how hopeless, how hopeless was this situation in which David finds himself. Well, th there's no place of peace for David. Uh, he's not at peace generally in society, going in and out, attending to his affairs, military affairs, and other things. He's, he's not uh, at peace then because he knows that Saul is manipulating things to, to get at him. He's not safe in the palace where there are spears flying through the air. He's not safe at home where there are men waiting outside, ready to pounce on David and to get him if he leaves the house. He's not safe then in the environment of the palace. He's not safe uh, even when he goes to Samuel in the school of the prophets at Nioth. It seems to be that there is no place where he feels safe. There's no peace for him. He's restless. We could think of Noah uh, and the ark and the dove that he sent out. And he sends a dove out into the world wants the rains to stop falling and there's nowhere for the dove to rest, her foot. And so the dove flits about over the face of the water and can't find anywhere to be at rest and has to come back into the ark. There is restlessness. 
And David was like that. He's restless. He goes here, he goes there, he comes to another place, and he can't find any rest. And there's that sense of hopelessness when we can't rest. There's no moment of relief. And you look at this background to, to, to chapter 20, and you realize that whether it's day or night, there's, there's no peace for him, there's no rest. So he goes home uh, at night time, and his wife tells him there are men outside waiting to kill you. He can't even go into his own home and lie down and be at peace there. There's no moment, there's no place for him to rest. And so this sense of hopelessness and with it then despair and so on uh, becomes very real for David. And you get that insight into the hopeless state of mind that he is in. When, as we've noticed before, he, he comes to Jonathan and he's, he's troubled in his mind. What have I done? Uh, he, he's not unaware that Saul wants to kill him. He's very aware of that. But he really can't figure it out. Now, it's nigh on impossible to rationally discover the workings of an irrational mind. You can't rationally work out how an irrational mind works. It's a bit like people saying, how does a person do that? And I often say, well, if you understood how a person could commit some horrendous, barbaric, deplorable act, if you could understand the way their mind thought, you would be capable of doing the same thing, and you might even think to do the same thing. You don't want to know how they could do what they do. You can be thankful that you don't understand how they could do what they have done. Who can understand why Saul behaves like he does? Strictly speaking, we, we cannot because we're not there. We don't think like him. We don't act like him, thankfully. Uh, that's true for David. And yet he's, he's, he's pursued with these thoughts. They come chasing after him. Again, it contributes, you see, to him not being able to find any peace or rest. His mind is disturbed. What have I done? And you can imagine him going back over all the events of the past. Was there anything that he had done? Was there any justification for Saul doing what Saul was doing? And so that means he doesn't only have no peace externally, he has no peace internally either. And that really contributes to a man feeling somewhat hopeless. Uh, just as an aside, really, uh, for the Christian, the enemy of our soul is the devil would pursue after us without just cause. And very often, as he does, the Christian can be vexed then with this kind of question, have I done something wrong? You see, the, the devil is called the accuser, isn't he? And he accuses people falsely, oftentimes. Even if they have sinned, the accusation isn't just that you have sinned, but the accusation is that because you have sinned or sinned in such a way or sinned yet again in the same kind of issue, that there is no forgiveness with God. And the devil lays that accusation against the Christian. And so perhaps the, the Christian then is tempted in their own mind, pursued by the enemy, to, to start asking doubtful questions. Have I done something wrong? Is there no hope for me? Is there no pardon with God for me? Maybe, maybe it's true that God's mercies have run out. Maybe God has lost patience with me and he, he won't be long suffering anymore. And it is possible for a Christian to get there. But the answer to those questions are the answers that are given to us by the Apostle Paul in Romans 8. Who is he that condemneth? Who condemns you if you're a Christian tonight? Does God condemn you? Does the devil condemn you? Can he condemn you? Do you condemn yourself? Does your sin condemn you? The answer to that is, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. In other words, there is an objective answer to that question. There is a reality that answers that question. And the, the, basically, the question is answered this way. There is nobody that can condemn me. Why? Because Jesus Christ has been condemned by God in my place. Therefore, there can be no more condemnation against me. That's the reality. And so these questions that come against us, 
they can be answered. Otherwise, we would end up in a place of total despair, of hopelessness, of turmoil and torment internally, and all that would be exhibited uh, by that state of mind outwardly. And the way that we can tell the difference between the accusations of the devil and true Holy Spirit conviction, the devil always leads to despair. The devil accuses people of sin, but he doesn't lead them to a place of peace. He leads them just to further despair and hopelessness. Whenever God convicts somebody of sin, he always leads them to Christ. And if your sight of your sin and your understanding of your sin just leads you to a sense of hopelessness, it is safe to assume that the one behind those accusations is not God but Satan. God will always lead you to Christ. To see your sin, to hate that sin, and to turn from it unto the Lord Jesus Christ for forgiveness. But if, when you see your sin and your wrongdoing, that all you see is dread and lostness and darkness, that's not the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. That is the counterfeit work of the devil. Don't listen to that accusing voice, but listen to the voice of the gospel that tells us that Christ has died, yea, rather that has risen again. And so David, in this sense of hopelessness, realizes that the only person he can turn to is Saul's son. In some way, that only adds to the sense of hopelessness. Um, and, and I say that not because there's anything questionable about Jonathan or that he's going to prove treacherous. But in this case, as we have read and, and we've noticed before, when David turns to Jonathan, and Jonathan, it's perhaps a bit of naivety. Uh, it's a bit of uh, him not really grasping the seriousness of the situation. Jonathan says, well, don't worry, because if Dad's going to do something to you, he'll tell me first. Now, whenever the person that you're turning to for help is clueless, and seems to be a bit detached from reality and isn't able to work out the most basics of the situation, it doesn't do much to inspire confidence in you. And perhaps your heart sinks a little bit more because you think, here am I in this situation, I'm turning to this individual for help, and they can't put two and two together. I'm snookered. I'm in real trouble. There's a sense of despair, and... The, the only person to help him, he feels, is, is Jonathan. And then, to, to make things worse, if it could get any worse, if the hopelessness wasn't bad enough already, we read here that there was a feast coming up the next day. This feast uh, that was uh, time-wise, it wasn't to the new moon, it wasn't worshipping the moon, but uh, it was a feast regulated, governed in terms of time by the appearing of the new moon. And David was supposed to sit there in the company of Saul at this feast. And of course, it would be uh, crazy, really, to think that David would actually turn up. Uh, the last time he was in Saul's presence in the palace, Saul threw a spear at him. So he's not going to turn up and, and sit down and say, well, uh, it's the new moon feast and you expect me to come. Here I am. Um, he's, he's going to be arrested at the very least, if not uh, killed outright. So we don't expect David to turn up to the feast. However, he is expected to be there, even if Saul doesn't expect him to be there, if that makes sense. It's his duty to be there. He's supposed to be there. If he doesn't show up, he hasn't been given a leave of absence. He's AWOL as far as the king's concerned. And therefore, Saul's argument against David is only going to be strengthened. Saul now will be able to say to people, Ah, you see what the kind of man he is? You see his character? He was supposed to be there. He's failing in his duty. He won't come to the feasts to, to be part of my royal entourage and retinue. Uh, he's failing in his duty. He's not a good character. And so this is going to make the situation worse. And David feels hopeless because if he goes... He's dead. If he doesn't go, he's going to be maligned and further ridiculed in the, in the face 
of the public he's caught between a rock and a hard place. So you understand there's a real sense of hopelessness as far as David is concerned in this situation. And the question for us tonight is how hopeless are we? How hopeless is your situation? Now you might not feel hopeless. I don't know, I can't read your heart tonight. I don't know your innermost thoughts and your feelings. You might not feel hopeless. You might feel a little bit of hopelessness. But the reality is that without help from God, we are totally hopeless. Uh, in the book of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul reminds us of this idea of hopelessness. And he talks about having no hope. Ephesians 2 and the verse 12. Now, who has no hope? And why do they have no hope? Well, listen to what he says. He says that at that time, ye were without Christ. So he's talking to the Ephesian Christians, and he's talking about their past. Which reminds us, by the way, nobody is a Christian because they were born a Christian. That at that time, sometime in the past, ye were without Christ. You weren't a Christian. These people had become Christians. You were not born a Christian. You have to become a Christian. You go from being a non-Christian to being a Christian. You go from being unsaved to being saved, from being dead in trespasses and sins to being born again. So at some time in their past, they were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. So they were, they were Gentiles. They didn't belong to the people of God in the Old Testament who had the blessings of God's word, the temple, the sacrifices, the priesthood, all of the things that were God's way of communicating his truth to them. You were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And that expression, without God in the world, we understand the Greek word because it's atheist, it's or a theos, it's an atheist. An atheist is somebody who says, no God. And here are people who are without God in the world. And if they are without God and without Christ, they are without hope. David, without Jonathan, has no hope. You, without Jesus Christ, you have got no hope. You have no hope. If you won't have Christ as your Savior, you have no hope of salvation. You have no hope of heaven. You have no hope in eternity. Your eternity will be a hopeless existence. Hopeless. Without hope. That's a, that's a frightful thing to even countenance, even to think about. And I, I can't help but think about the rich man. Remember that Jesus talked about the rich man and Lazarus, and the rich man died, and he opened his eyes being er, in hell, being in torment. And he was in the flame. And he had a desire. He had a strong desire. And his desire was that someone would take a single drop of water and put it on his tongue to ease his pain just for a fleeting moment of time. That's what he wanted. He desperately wanted that, but he was told it wouldn't happen. He had no hope of any relief from his suffering. He was hopeless. And he was hopeless in eternity because he was Christless in time. He was hopeless in eternity because he didn't have God in time. And that's the reality. I have to have no hope, no prospect of any betterment, no prospect of things improving, to be without any source of help coming to you. you. Wherever you look, there's no help. Wherever you turn, there's no refuge, there's no peace, there's no rest. And that's, that's hell. It's a, it's a restless place. Their worm dieth not. They are in agony day and night. That's the sad reality of an eternity spent outside of God's love and God's grace in hell. 
There's hopelessness. And I think you've got examples of that in, in individuals. Think of Judas. Remember Judas who betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ for a few pieces of silver. He wanted, he wanted something that the world could give him. He wanted money. The love of money is the root of all evil. And another man in the New Testament called Demas. And, and again, the same problem was his, that he forsook really the Lord for the sake of money, for silver, for riches. And Judas was overcome with that sense of despair when he realized what he had done. And yet he was hopeless. And, and he was hopeless because he wouldn't turn to Christ. You see, he was without Christ. He didn't turn to Christ to find help. Who did he turn to? He turned to the chief priests. He turned to the rulers of the Jews that had agreed with him, that had schemed with him to betray the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he turns to them and he hands back the money, he doesn't find any release from his despair. He doesn't find any comfort to his soul. He, he tells them that he has done the wrong thing. And their simple answer to him is, well, that's got nothing to do with us. See you to it. There's no words of forgiveness there. There's no words of hope. There's no compassion. There's no love. There's no, oh, you poor man, you're in agony of soul. You're in distress of mind. You, you need some relief. And they can't give it to him. It's not theirs to give. And yet they don't even care. And if you go to the world tonight to find some relief from your despair and to give you some hope, the world doesn't have Christ. Christ isn't in the world. And they're not going to point you to Christ and they're not going to care about your soul. And Judas was a hopeless man. His, his case is so pitiful and so distressing to, to watch him in complete agony of mind. And yet he's got no hope because he's not but Christ. And Judas, or Saul, I think, in a sense, is the same here as well. Remember, Saul has rejected God. Therefore, God's rejected Saul. Saul would not listen to God. And God said, that's it. I'm not listening to you ever again. And from that moment on, Saul becomes a different man. That the evil spirit comes upon him, remember? He behaves differently because he doesn't have the influence of God's word in his life. And that's not a good thing. People think, ah, oh, if only we can get God out of our lives. You know, young people sometimes think, if only I can get away from being in a Christian home. I felt that way when I was younger, brought up in the gospel. If only I could just get a bit of liberty. Not having to go to church and the meetings and all the rest of it. How much better life would be. I'm glad, I'm eternally grateful to God that he pursued me. And I realized and, and, and could see that there was, it wasn't a better thing at all. And there was no betterment in the world. And the world is not a better place. And the society of the world that, where God isn't and Christ isn't, is not a, it's not a place of liberty and it's not a place of joy. It's a, it's a sad place. It's a bitter place. And you can have wasted years, young people. Sometimes it might seem a bit of a drudge, a bit of a weariness. Church again. And that man, he goes on at an awful rate. Maybe I do sometimes go on a bit too much. And I trust you'll forgive me if I do, but I'm, I'm anxious to tell you the truth of God. Sometimes it can seem hard and wearying. And if I do contribute to that, I apologize for that. But listen, there's no better option out there in the world. The world has got nothing to offer you. It's got hopelessness. That's all the world has got, hopelessness and despair. There's nothing to be found out there that will offer you true hope. And Saul proved that. He rejected God. He wouldn't listen to God. And, and the evil spirit comes upon him. He starts turning in people. He becomes angry, I think. Some of his anger is, is born out of his sense of hopelessness and guilt. When people feel guilty and hopeless, they get frustrated. And they lash out at others around them. They lash out at people that do have hope. They lash out at the people that have got something that they don't have. And they hate them with a, with a passion. 
And sometimes that's why people hate Christians, because the Christian has got hope and they've got peace and they've got joy. And there are people in the world that don't have that. And instead of asking, where do you get this peace and joy? And where, how is it that you've got this hope? They, they feel resentful and they feel bitter towards those that have hope. And Saul's like that. And what you see in Saul is a man who's full of anguish and despair and guilt and the darkness of hopelessness. And he's lashing out as an angry, frustrated man, like so many in our world today. And that's you and me without God. Without Christ, we are hopeless. We live in an angry, uncaring world. And part of the reason is the hopelessness that abounds. And we see again from Ephesians that being without God is due to something. He goes on, the apostle goes on here to say, but now, so he's speaking again about these Ephesians, something has happened in time now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, far away from God, are made nigh, or you're brought near, you're brought close by the blood of Christ. Why do we need the blood of Christ? We need the blood of Christ to cover our sins, to wash us from our sin. What is it that keeps us away from God and therefore gives and produces a hopelessness? It's our sin. It's sin that alienates us from God. It's sin that keeps us away from God. It's sin that produces hopelessness. And what is sin? It's rebellion, isn't it? Again, we see it in Saul's life. We see it with Judas. It's not listening to God. God offers mercy. If you honor me, God says, I will honor you. Saul chooses not to. Judas, the Lord Jesus, remember at the, at the Last Supper, we read that Jesus took the sop and he, he gave it to Judas. That was that sop indicates a person, when you give it to somebody at the meal, that indicates that you respect the person that you're giving it to. You're, you're placing a value on them. You're treating them like a great honored guest at your feast. And Jesus offered that to Judas. And in doing so, he was making it very, very clear that there was love and compassion and, and tenderness in the heart of the Savior, that if Judas would turn to Christ, he would find somebody who was willing and able to help him, but he wouldn't turn. He held on to his sin. And so he was far away from God. Do not hold on to your sin tonight. Be willing tonight to, to lose everything so that you can gain Christ. Be willing to lose life itself if it means you gain Christ. As the Savior said, it is if you're right, I offend you. If it's holding you back, if it's what you're looking at that holds you back from coming to God, take your right eye and pluck it out because it's better to enter into eternal life blind than to have two eyes and go to hell. If your right hand offends you, if it's what you're doing that is a stumbling block and it, it tempts you and it holds you back, cut it off, cast it from you. Because it's better to enter into life maimed than to have two hands and enter into everlasting fire. Don't let anything stand between you and Christ. Get rid of it. Cut it off. Be prepared to lose everything so that you can have Christ because without Him you've got no hope. And you do not want to live a hopeless life. Nobody wants to live a hopeless life. We all want hope. Politicians thrive in telling you that they can offer you hope. Oh, we've got hope, 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 hope. They can't tell you how, you can, how this hope's going to be realized. It's just a simple word. It's a slogan. It's meaningless. It's empty. But it's not empty when it comes to Christ. He gives us real hope. Hope for today. Hope for tomorrow. Hope for eternity. And it's real hope. It's not will-o'-the-wisp stuff. It's genuine. But it's only if we have Christ. What are we to do? Well, David, David turns to, to Jonathan on account of the covenant that we've noticed had been established. And then all of David's uncertainty, that covenant was the only thing of certainty that he had in his life. That was the only thing that he could be sure of and that he could rest upon in his life. The one that David turns to had committed himself to help David. It was a covenant of the Lord, David says, because it was established with God as a witness between them. 
And therefore, it was a covenant of strength. And you notice that when David speaks to Jonathan about this, he's not approaching, and he doesn't approach Jonathan in a sense of, I'm your equal, or I'm as good as you. In verses 7 and 8, three times David calls himself thy servant. He's taking a humble position. He's basically saying, I am nothing before you. I can't demand that you do this. I'm not able to give you an order to say, help me. I'm nothing before you. He's coming as the lesser to the greater. And he's coming asking for something in particular. Notice what he says in verse 8. Therefore, thou shalt deal kindly with thy servant. Thou shalt deal kindly with thy servant. And I think, uh, I wasn't here, but I, I heard that our, when our brother Mike Murr was here a few weeks ago when we were in holidays, I think he taught uh, folks here a, a Hebrew word, chesed, uh, God's mercy, his loving kindness, his chesed. That's the word that's used here. David is saying that Jonathan shall deal kindly with thy servant. He will show him mercy. He will show him loving kindness. The idea of said, and I don't want to repeat what our brother said necessarily, but I'm sure we all can do with uh, refreshment of our memories, but said has this idea in it of love and compassion, affection, but with the additional thought of loyalty, reliability, and faithfulness. And so, said, as we understand this expression in Hebrew, as we find it translate it here as as dealing kindly. It's not just love, it's loyal love. It's not just kindness, but it's dependable kindness. It's not just affection, but it's affection that has committed itself to act. And this is who God is. This is our encouragement tonight, that David asks Jonathan to show him chesed, to show him kindness, to deal with him kindly because this is the covenant agreement. This is what has been agreed in this covenant. Now, we can come to God tonight and and we can ask God to remember us because of his covenant. But what gives us even more confidence in coming to God is that we recognize that God himself is full of mercy. This is his nature. See, Jonathan's nature seems to be of a, a good nature. He seemed a good nature lad. But Jonathan's nature was not one that was full of mercy. He was a sinner just like anybody else. But when we come to God, this is what I want you to see. When you come to God, you're coming to one whose very nature is merciful. That, that in a sense, would be enough. We've got so much confidence tonight in coming to God. Right? So if, if it was just the case that we were saying, well, God's nature is such that we can come to him with confidence, well, that really should be enough. But we've got more than that tonight. We can say, not only is this the nature of God, but God has entered into a covenant where he has committed himself to show mercy, to show loving kindness. It's doubly sure. So, uh, to to prove that point, Exodus 34, verse 6, God proclaims who he is. God tells us who he is. The Lord The Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Abounding in goodness and truth. Abounding in chesed, loving kindness. Reliable, dependable kindness. He's full of loyal love. He's full of this affection that is dependable true and is committed. That's his nature. When we go to God, that's what we find in him, and he is full of it. We've got a translation of that expression. It's essentially a translation of that expression in uh, John chapter 1. John chapter 1 speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it says this, and uh, of his fullness, uh, sorry, Verse 14 of John 1, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. I've referenced that already tonight, tabernacled amongst us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full 
of grace and truth, abundant in goodness and mercy. It's the same thing, which reminds us that Jesus Christ is truly God. He's got the same nature, exactly the same nature. He is full of grace and he's full of truth. Who do you turn to tonight in your hopelessness? Who do you turn to tonight because your sins keep you away from God? You can turn to one whose nature is such that he is full of reliable kindness. In other words, when Jesus says, come unto me, we don't have to fear. He says, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. I'll not cast you out if you come to me. If you come to me for mercy, you'll find mercy. If you come to me to find grace, you'll find grace. He's reliable. I want to urge you tonight and, and, and exhort you to, to turn to him. Because his nature is such that he'll not turn you away. But you've got more. He has given a promise. He's entered into this covenant that if you turn to him, there's something that he must do. He has to do it. It's not that you're going to him thinking, will he do it? Will he be in a good mood? Will he do it to me? He might do it to everybody else, but he might not do it to me. But he's given a commitment. He must do this. And you can look at his heart and you can look at his obligations and you know that he, he must give you this. He must deal kindly with you. And dear friend in the meeting tonight, young and old, if you turn to God tonight, he will deal kindly with you. Dear sinner, that's your confidence in coming to Jesus tonight. He's not going to turn you away. He's not going to say no. He's not going to condemn you. He's not going to judge you. He didn't come into the world to condemn the world. But he, he came into this world so that the world through him might have life. And he invites us to come to him so that we won't be cast out, but we'll be brought in and that he would, he would give us life. He will deal kindly with you. John later on would say this same thing. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He is faithful and true. He will deal righteously with us if we turn from our sin to him. If we turn from our hopelessness, which as we've said, is a result of our sin that keeps us alienated from God. If we turn in our sin in just hopelessness and we turn to God we, we can come with confidence to him tonight knowing that he will help us and we've read it tonight in Hebrews 8 and you'll read it again in Hebrews 10 we'll read it in God willing in a few weeks time then about this covenant and it's beautiful it's glorious that God will not remember our sins against us anymore. Isn't it, isn't it true that if you grasp that tonight and, that's, and you understand that, that God is not going to hold your sins against you anymore, that there's no sense of hopelessness when you hear that. That gives you hope. God is not going to remember my sins against me anymore. I can dare to hope. I can dare to believe. I can dare to have confidence that I know that when I die, I'm going to go to heaven because there's nothing to keep me out of heaven. Because God has promised he will not remember my sins against me anymore. He's going to pardon and forgive all of my unrighteousness and all of my iniquities. I've got hope. There's nothing to keep me out of heaven. There's nothing that threatens me now. I am secure. And if David had any sense of peace and comfort in coming to Jonathan and saying, there's a covenant between us, you have to deal kindly with me. And he believed that. And then he, he pinned everything on that. He relied on that completely. And it paid off, as we'll see. Jonathan did help him. 
he did deal kindly with him. If David had any confidence in Jonathan and Jonathan's commitment to that covenant, listen, that confidence is nothing compared to the confidence that you and I can have in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ must help you if you turn to him tonight. He cannot turn you away. He is bound by his own honor, by his own commitment, by his own nature to give you pardon and therefore to give you hope. Do you feel hopeless? Does life seem a little bit hopeless? Maybe you're despairing a little bit tonight. There is hope. That hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn to him and put your confidence in who he is and what he has committed himself to do and recognize that in that covenant that he has made on your behalf with God the Father that you can dare to live and you can dare to die based upon what he has done for your soul. Turn to him tonight. Don't hear this and then just walk off. Don't hear this and do nothing, but turn to Jesus tonight. Don't turn to yourself. Don't turn to a said prayer. Don't turn to that kind of thing where it's about you and what you've done. Turn to Christ. Trust the Savior. Put all your trust in Him. Make Him your, or bow the knee, I should say, and and own Him to be what He is. He is the Savior. He is the Lord. Acknowledge Him to be such tonight and submit yourself to Christ for your soul's sake. May God bless his word to all of our hearts tonight. Let's sing, uh, please.